All right, today we're gonna to take a look at a pretty common resistive force problem, and that is the situation of a ball which is released from rest and allowed to fall through water. So what we're gonna do in this problem is go through and solve for the position, velocity, and acceleration of this ball as functions of time. Now, in order to do that, what we first need to do is take a look at the forces which are gonna be acting on this ball as it falls through the water. Now first there's gravity, which is going to cause the ball to accelerate from rest downward. Now as this ball accelerates downward, it's going to push through the water. And as it moves through the water, there's going to be a building resistive force which acts against the motion of the ball by the water on the ball. Now as this ball accelerates downward and speeds up, the resistive force is going to grow. And we'll take a look at mathematically why that is in a little bit here. Now additionally, in reality, there would be a buoyant force uh, between the ball and the water because the ball is displacing some water. Uh, but we're gonna leave that force out of this today simply to keep this from getting too out of hand too quick. So what we're gonna do is take a look at these two forces and see how they relate to the motion of the ball using Newton's second law. Now in this problem, I'm gonna go ahead and say that downward is the positive direction. And so when putting these two forces into Newton's second law, we'll see, now expanding out FG. Now because this ball is traveling through water, we're gonna go ahead and say the resistive force is equal to BV. Or really the important thing here is it is proportional to the velocity of the ball. And substituting that in, we get. So what we have here is an equation which relates the velocity of the ball to its acceleration. But remember, what we're trying to do is come up with the equations for the position, velocity, and acceleration of this ball as it moves downward through the water. Now, in order to do that, what we need to realize is there's a relationship between V and A, and that is, now if we realize that acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time, we come up with this equation. And what we have here is the beginnings of a differential equation or really a way to relate the velocity of this ball to time. So I'm gonna rearrange this up here and set it up as a differential equation. Now remember, when we have a differential equation, what we wanna do is separate out our variables. So I'm gonna separate out our t from our v terms. Here we've got a dv and here we have a v. So what we have is an equation where we've related the change in velocity to the change in time. Like I said, we're setting up a differential equation here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sum of all changes in velocity from the initial velocity of the ball. Remember, it was released from rest to the final velocity. I'm just going to call this V or some velocity at any point in time. And we're going to look over a period or a change in time from some initial time zero to some final time T. So now what we're going to do is evaluate each of these integrals independently to come up with an equation for V as a function of time. So what we now have is an equation which relates the velocity as a function of time to all the other factors given in the problem, that is the mass, gravity, and the B value of this ball. Now there's several little things hiding out in this equation that are pretty important to us. The first thing we can see is that at a time of zero, this term right here, e to the negative bt over m, is gonna have a value of one. So one minus one is zero, and lo and behold, the initial val velocity of the ball is in fact zero per this equation. But as time goes on, if we were to make this time value an infinite value, eventually what we see is this term reduces to zero and we're left with just this, mg over b as the velocity after this ball has been falling for a very, very long time. And that is exactly what we would call the terminal velocity. And what that means is that if this ball was to fall through the water for a long time, it would eventually approach this terminal velocity. It will never go any faster than this term mg over b. Now to get a better handle on this equation, let's go ahead and graph this function.
See, what's happening in this problem is this ball is falling, and at first it's in free fall. There is no resistive force on it. But as it speeds up, this resistive force grows, and as a result, the acceleration decreases to a point where eventually the acceleration is zero. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So if we were to compare this to free fall, what we'd see in free fall is an object steadily having its magnitude of velocity increase downward. But as the resistive force starts to kick in in this problem and change the velocity of the ball, we see this ball approaches a terminal velocity and eventually just cruises along at what is near constant velocity as opposed to steadily increasing. So let's go one step further with this and take a look at the acceleration of the ball. Going back here and taking the derivative of velocity with respect to time to get acceleration, we'll see. This equation is giving us acceleration versus time. And you'll see at a time of zero, this term e to the negative bt over m is one. And so our initial acceleration is g, just as though this was in free fall. And that mimics what we saw here with velocity. But as time goes on, the acceleration is going to approach zero. See, the initial acceleration is g, but as time goes on and the resistive force grows, the acceleration is going to decrease. And you can see that in this equation right here. If gravity is constant and the resistive force increases, the acceleration is going to decrease. And last, let's take a look at the position versus time of this ball as it moves downward through the water. So rather than taking the derivative of velocity versus time like we did to get to acceleration, we're going to integrate that function to get position as a function of time. Now, when integrating velocity as a function of time to get position, I find it's easiest to distribute this into these parentheses here first, and you've got to be really careful of the chain rule as you go through that. But we come up with this function here. Now, you'll see what I've done is I've taken and I've set our plus c term to a value such that the position versus time is going to be zero at a time of zero. So really what we're looking at here is displacement. So to get a better picture for what this equation really looks like, let's go ahead and graph it. So what we'll see is at first, this curve looks as though it's a parabola, just as though this ball was in free fall. And that's exactly what we saw here. For a little while, the curve of velocity mimicked the curve that we see for free fall, but as the resistive force kicked in, those curves deviated. And we see a similar issue here. At first, this curve is parabolic, but as the resistive force starts to kick in and we approach terminal velocity, our position versus time graph approaches a constant slope. So this curve for position versus time is approaching an asymptote, but that asymptote is not vertical or horizontal, it's at an angle, and that is what we'd call an oblique asymptote. And the slope of that oblique asymptote is the terminal velocity. So what we've done in this problem is we've taken a look at a situation where a ball was released from rest, and as it falls through the water, the resistive force on it grows. Now that complicates the kinematics of this ball. We can't use the kinematic equations, of course. Uh, what we have to do is go through and looking at Newton's second law, set up a differential equation so that we can come up with the position, velocity, and acceleration of that ball. We've also managed to graph those functions to get a better picture of what's going on here. But this is the ball falling through water problem. And that's all for now.